Hello, and welcome to Leadership as a Philosophy, Not a Checklist, book discussion number 25, and this is the allegory of the cave. Now, clearly, I'm taking on a pretty big subject because this is by Plato. It's something that's been quoted by everybody. And what is interesting about it is I believe fundamentally that the wisdom of the allegory is 100% correct. Why? Because you can go online and search and look and find everybody having their own take on it. So initially I was concerned that I needed to find out and make sure I wasn't conflicting or arguing with any scholars or any specific people. And like I said, even the scholars don't agree. Um, the, the core, yes, but then there's a bunch of stuff that's, that's different. What frustrated me, though, is I'm pretty sure that I had to read The Republic at some point when I was younger, and I don't remember any of it. I didn't even remember that this was in it. And what's frustrating now is if you go look up for a PDF of The Allegory of the Cave, it's only the story about the cave. I'll, I'll talk about this in the, in the next part. It's only the story about the cave, and then it leaves out a whole bunch of other stuff. And the stuff that they leave out is stuff that I didn't realize and found very interesting. So even while doing the allegory of the cave research, I had to go through the allegory of the cave in my mind. So we're going to go through this and, and, and talk about it. The reason I'm using this for leadership is because as opposed to what some people say, they say, oh, this is about justice and oh, this is about education. It is about all that stuff, but there's a whole bunch of things about leaders and who should be in charge and all this other stuff that's left out of the whole allegory, which is very frustrating to me. So like I said, we're going to go through it and you'll get to see my take on it, which will be fine. You can add this to the plethora of stuff that's out there. All right. So the cave. This is the best picture I could find. Um, so Plato's talking to one of his one of his acolytes and basically says, so imagine a cave. There's people that are chained. So you see down here, these people that are chained up against the wall and they're looking at some shadows. The shadows are being cast by these cutouts that are being carried around by people that are blocked from view. So all these guys can see, or all these prisoners can see, are the shadows. Neat thing about what's in the text is he calls these the puppeteers or the image makers. It says this is behind a screen that puppeteers use, and the image makers are carrying this back and forth and making sounds trying to imitate the forms that they're showing. So if we look here, there's a pot, there's a horse, there's a bird, there's a, there's a circle or a hoop. Great. Then behind them is a fire. And the fire is what's being used to cast the shadows. Okay, great. So this, this works at every level of extraction, so, or uh, at uh, uh, every level of uh, abstraction. So this happens with your individual thoughts, happens with organizations, the whole deal. So just, you'll see where I'm going with this. So then what happens is either a prisoner is let go, or in a story, he says, uh, the prisoner is let go and then turned around to face the fire. Well, since they've been sitting, looking at the shadows and the fire and the light emanating from the fire, they, um, their eyes hurt when they look at this. So it's now painful for them. So there's pain in suddenly having your perspective changed. And then the, the person that let them free comes and says, look, those shadows are coming from these objects that are being manipulated by these people. But there's, there's more to be found. Let me show you. So the person first has to go from realize, thinking that this was all that they saw to now this is what they're seeing to now understanding that there may be more that they're not even prepared to see. So everything's two-dimensional at this point. Then they, the person drags them up the cave, up this steep and difficult slope, and as they get closer and closer to the light outside, they experience more pain. They, they, you know, their eyes haven't adjusted. They can't handle it. And so it's painful 
and it's excruciating for them to come from the two-dimensional world. First, they come out into the into the into the light, and the light blinds them. And at first, they can't see anything, and then they can see some of the shadows that are cast by things. They see reflections of things. Then pretty soon, they see an actual pot or an actual horse, bird, and realize that there's colors and there's different forms, and they make different sounds than what these the image makers were having to make. And so now they're enlightened. So that's usually where the story stops. So that's you reaching enlightenment. Okay. It's fascinating. And like I said, if you imagine this, this can be an organization. This can be your thoughts on things. This Just go back and think about all the scientific discoveries that were made. The scientists that thought they didn't realize that washing your hands before delivering babies would stop death at childbirth. They were looking at the shadows and then they got enlightened and then they had to go back in again, right? They have to go back down and look at what else they knew and come back. So that's the story. I'm going to talk about next what was left out. And it's very frustrating. So analysis. So the allegory works for all levels of perception. So you can do it with your own stuff and then you can do it for the planet and you can do it for all sorts of different things. It works all the time. Everybody has their take on it which means the wisdom was correct because it can be applied to everything. Uh, what is funny is that they make a comment about the fact that the people looking at the shadows uh, congratulate each other and are giving each other prizes and awards for being able to predict what the shadow is going to do. And one of the questions that's asked is, would you want to go back into that world and get those rewards once you know that that's not the correct information? But I do think it's funny because you'll see where I'm going with this. But you see lots of people giving each other awards for stuff that are that are they're not award worthy, if that makes sense. And then, just like they talked about, so these people have been in the cave, according to the story, been in the cave for a long time. Well, that means their eyes have never seen the firelight. And so when they turn around and see it, it's the brightest thing they've ever seen. So it's all this pain. So the longer that you've been in the dark, the more painful it is to come to the light. Great, right? And then the thing is, is it's something that's not in there, but it's something that I thought about. It's okay, so you turn around and realize that you were being lied to or that the images weren't correct. So you decide to become one of the image makers. Well, do you, do you, do you know what's outside still? No, you're still just repeating what the image makers are telling you to repeat. You're still just getting in line with the system and going around repeating the system or in your own thoughts. So what was left out? This is the stuff that I read and I was just shocked. And it, it just makes me wonder when you see some of these things, it's, you know, did I read it? And it's again, it's one of those books that I was told to read and read it. And nobody gave me any context. So did it just stink and stink? Did it just stick in my subconscious? And so some of these things that I'm talking about now are that, I mean, nothing I'm saying is new. This just reaffirms it. So return to the cave. So there's three types of people that leave that once they've become enlightened. There's the people that get out and want to stay out. They don't want to go back at all. They say, I like this light. I like the things. I like all of this stuff. I don't want to go back. Great. Then there's the people that want to get out or people that get out and want to go back and inform everybody. But what happens? Just think about this in your own life. So somebody, here's the group think, somebody finds out the truth and goes back to the group and says, hey, we're not, this isn't right. We got to do this. Let me tell you what's out there. Well, these people have never seen what's out there. So the first thing they think is that this person has gone crazy. And in the book, in the text, it says, well, they, so they conspire to kill him or to ignore him. Well, just you can think immediately about five different things where here was the here was the preponderance of thought. Somebody comes with a with a with an external piece of information and everybody says, You're a heretic, you're an idiot, you're a liar, you're this, you're that, and then later on you find out it's true. But then the third one is go back, go out. Learn as much as you can about there and then go back into the cave and get your sight back and get used to seeing what those people have seen 
But now that you have the wisdom of the outside world, you can describe it to people in a way that will free them because you can use those terms that they're looking at to say, well, actually, blah, 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 instead of let me explain something you've never heard of before. This is what Plato says should be the norm. And look, I've run into it right now. I think I've told you at, at this point, I've emailed 18 different PhD people in management and leadership asking them to talk about this stuff. And the count's still the same. One person answered and said, it may be in the future. Another one sent me their fee structure. Nobody else has answered. So those are the people that got out and don't want to enlighten. Plato says you need to go out and then go back and teach. You got to go back into the cave. You got to go back in and do the work and try to get the people out of there to get them up to the enlightenment. And then this is where we start talking about the leadership stuff. It says the saint or the philosopher is usually the best fitted, but the least inclined to rule. But they're the people that should rule. So the people that are thinking and asking lots of questions and have great character, those are the people best suited, least inclined. Those who rule must not be those who are desirous to rule. What did I say on the one in the power? The video about the power it says the people that want power are the least qualified to handle it. The people that are thirsty for the power should never get it because they're going to wield it. Right. And so the, here's all this leadership stuff, even though people say, oh, it's about justice. It's about this. Nobody mentions these things. So I had to go read the whole text. Now I'm going to go have to reroll the whole republic. I just read chapter seven, which is where this whole stuff is. This whole stuff, this whole list of stuff is. Then they got the characteristics of rulers. Now, I think this must reference it for another another page. I mean, another chapter. So I'm going to have to go, like I said, I have to go read the whole thing. But some of the stuff, I just, I wrote down sort of some notes about what they were looking at for people that should be in charge. They should be brave, fair, noble, generous. They should be... Um, have ready powers of acquisition or the ability to learn quickly, able to think, good memory, be a solid human that enjoys labor and can go do the work that everybody needs to do. Um, the, uh, what does it talk about? Oh, and then it talks about integrity. It says somebody should be industrious and thoughtful. Truth is important because it should be you should find somebody who hates voluntary falsehood and is extremely indignant when they tell lies, but patient of involuntary falsehood, which means making a mistake, and who wallows in the mile of, mile of mire of ignorance and is happy to be corrected. Well, what's that? Well, that's integrity. That's humility. Doing the work that everybody can do, that's empathy. The only thing that's missing, missing is vigilance. Temperance, courage, magnificence, soul, body, mind, justice. It says those are the sort of people that we need to make sure and they've got the philosophy. And then if we don't send people up and we put them in charge that don't have these characteristics, then people are going to mock philosophy. It was, it's a complicated paragraph and I couldn't summarize it correctly. I'm probably going to do a part two where I go read the whole thing and extract the leadership lessons from it. So, so now what? So let's think about what we're talking about. So why does this apply to leadership? Well, it's easy. I'm doing this. I started this because I'm writing, I'm going to give a speech in a couple of weeks. And I was writing down my thoughts on the speech and realized that this is the answer to what I was talking about. So I'm couching it all in this. So let's go and look at the cave again. All right. So let's fill in the blanks now. Now that we've got the allegory, Let's fill in the blanks. Ready? All right. So the people that are chained are the people in charge. Think about right now in current society with most of our quote unquote leaders. People in charge chain there. All they're doing is looking at the wall. This is their organization, right? So the organizations are what people are looking at. Chained to the wall. Well, the image makers are the people that are selling systems and certificates and degrees. 
So those are all two-dimensional things. So these people are carrying back and forth, making all these noises, saying, here's your certificates, here's your degree, here's what you need, here's what you have to have in order for this organization to happen. Well, the people in charge can now predict all the things that are happening in organization. All the time I hear people say, oh, if your turnover is high, you've got bad leadership. Well, what's your turnover like? What's really high? So what's your what's the problem? And so they're able to predict and, and give each other awards for saying that we're great and blah, blah, blah. But all they are is they're giving each other awards for the systems and certificates that are given to them by the image makers. So then the light, this is the best that human beings can do, right? So they're making a fire, can't be too hot or you'll smoke everybody out, whatever. So here's the light that's being produced, made by humans to illuminate this system by humans. And so this system right here is, is all kind of a mess because yeah, yeah, you've got organizational stuff. You've got some people in charge. You've got all these pieces of paper and this is all that you need. This is all the light that you need to illuminate that stuff. Well, what happens when you go out here? Well, suddenly you become enlightened and you realize that actual leadership is completely different. There's so much more color. There's so much more dimension. There are infinite possibilities. And then he talks about in the, in the thing that this getting out here is aiming for the ultimate good. Well, that's the thing. That was the, the, the um, fulcrum of my whole thought process on this when it says you got to aim for the ultimate good. This is not aiming for the ultimate good. But you get out here and realize you got to take care of your people. You got to have a have a, an infinite, I mean, a, a refined philosophy. You have to understand that organizations have all these permutations and all this sort of stuff. So then what happens? Well, then you've got the people that go out and take their degrees and are enlightened and go, I don't want to go back because it's scary down there. Then you've got the people that come back down here and are stumbling around trying to describe what actual leadership is, but they can't. Right. Not because they're un incapable. It's because they didn't spend the time to come back, learn what these people were seeing and combine that with what was outside of the cave and then try to teach it in the right way. And then you've got the person that I like to say is, is humbly, I'm one of these people that's trying to come back in and describe what's outside in the terms that are in here. And so this is the, this is the problem, right? And so what happens is then what you have to do is get somebody who understands all this, send them back down here to replace the image makers and start projecting images up here of what real leadership looks like to free people's minds from that to get them outside. Had somebody the other day tell me that you can't lead these young kids, right? Well, the problem is these young kids have been the young kids for generations and hundreds and hundreds of years. We have a couple of organizations in my hometown, in my hometown, where I live right now, that have unbelievable reputations and customer service with these kids. Well, what's that? What's well, leadership, right? So the people that just say, well, we can train anybody to be a leader, they're looking at a shadow because the system says so. We can make anybody this, system says so. These young kids are a problem, system says so. So that's my take on it. So the, so the leadership stuff, the real genuine leadership is the ultimate good, right? And you have to have the character. You have to have humility. You have to have integrity. You have to have empathy and the talent to be able to describe to people what's going on out there. So you got to go, what have I said about leadership? You got to meet people where they are and bring them to the light or bring them to the goal. Here it is. It's all here all here nothing that i'm doing is original <laughs> it's a little frustrating all right so that's my take on the allegory of the cave and how it applies to leadership but like i said you can apply it to anything so oh ancient wisdom i'm sorry so the ancient wisdom right like we've talked about the characteristics and talent of leaders have been around since the earliest recorded history that we have the epic of gilgamesh the kalevala uh, the Bhagavad Gita, the Bible, right? 
I don't know if it's in the Book of the Dead. I don't think the Egyptian Book of the Dead talks about this stuff. I haven't read it yet. Like I said, I'm, it's my project for the year. It's going to be a problem. But here's the ancient wisdom about leadership, and it's been the same. It's none of this. Anyway, so here we go back to the archetypal leadership model. We've talked about this a bunch of times, right? Personality, openness to experience. That was one of the characteristics. High positive emotion. That was uh, noble, generous, brave. High intellect, quick to learn, right? And then the talent and then all this sort of stuff. You've seen this before. But there's nothing There's nothing in the in what I read. Of course, I have to go, like I said, read the whole thing. That dissuades any of this. They do talk about four types of governments, but I wasn't clear on the. I wasn't clear on that. I mean, some of this stuff, like I said, it was written twenty five hundred years ago or twenty four hundred years ago. I was. I wasn't clear on what they were trying to say. So it's this is. And I reached out to some PhDs and said, "Please contact me back, and we can talk about this, and I can ask questions." Nope. And then this is just a picture of the thing. You can get it on PDF. Um, I think that I got my copy on Google Play Books because they had it for free. Um, so, you know, you can get a hold of it, but it, this is neat. I mean, I like this. I like this image a lot. I was trying to look for something that was a bigger scale, but I couldn't find it. Anyway, sorry if it seems like I'm rambling, but do your own, do your own research. Go read it and look at it yourself and you'll see that it's like, it's just so, it's so correct. And I had to go through the same process of understanding what I didn't know correctly about this allegory while doing the allegory. So I had to come back and go, oh my gosh, I had it all wrong. Here's what it is. All right. Thank you very much for your attention. Sorry this went a little long. I uh, hope you have a great day.